Let's use our knowledge of rotational work to analyze the motion of a flywheel. What's a flywheel, you ask? Good question. Flywheel is a wheel that goes on a shaft that has a significant amount of inertia to it. So it has a high moment of inertia, which makes it harder to get the shaft spinning, but easier to keep the shaft spinning. So if we're, for example, driving this shaft with a motor and we're also using it to cut through stuff with a circular saw, let's say, then when we encounter resistance, maybe some particularly hard piece of wood, you don't want it to judder and have trouble cutting through that and stall out your electric motor. So you have a flywheel that makes it so that the shaft wants to keep spinning even when it encounters something difficult to cut through. We start from rest and we apply some torque on this of 12 Newton meters to spin this through eight revolutions until we get up to speed, it looks like. So our angular displacement is going to be eight revolutions which I might want to convert to radians using two pi radians is one revolution. This should cancel out the revolutions and leave me with 16 pi radians worth of angular displacement. All right, so now let's see. We want to know what's the angular velocity after we've made it through these eight revolutions. I'm going to draw a before and after diagram before we have my shaft with an angular velocity before of zero because we start from rest initially. After, we have kind of the same thing. It's our flywheel, but now it's moving with some angular velocity omega b. We'll write a work energy statement and try and figure out our final angular velocity. So work energy. We can say that whatever kinetic energy we start with, plus the work done by that torque as we speed up our shaft, is going to equal our final kinetic energy. I'll substitute in our knowledge of rotational kinetic energy is one half i omega squared, where this is omega a. Our work is the integral of torque d theta, and our final kinetic energy is one half i omega b squared. We know that omega a is zero, so that makes our life nice. If we have a constant torque, which we do, this is a constant and comes out front of the integral, and we just get the integral of d theta is theta, so we end up with our angular displacement there. That leaves us with torque delta theta equaling one half i omega b squared. That's one equation with one unknown. The only thing we don't know is omega b. We know i, we know torque, we know delta theta. We'll solve that for omega b by multiplying by two, dividing by i, and then taking the square root. That leaves us with omega b is equal to two torque delta theta divided by i square root. We'll plug in our values. Twice the torque of 12 newton meters times our angular displacement that we'll plug in in radians to make the units work out, 16 pi radians, and divided by our moment of inertia, 30 kilogram meter squared. Unit-wise, how does that work out? Uh, I'm going to write some units here. Newtons are kilogram meters per second squared, and then we have times another meters. Radians are a ratio, effectively unitless, and then we can divide by our kilograms and meters squared. That looks pretty good. We can now cancel out the meter squared on the top and the bottom, cancel out the kilograms. We're left with one over second squared. When you take the square root, you end up with one over seconds or radians per second. Exactly what we would hope. Which gives us 
a numerical value of 6.3 in units of radians per second. We don't have enough information about directions here to specify anything meaningful about the direction, but it's, it's the direction of torque, is the direction of the velocity, it's the direction that the torque was accelerating it in. There we go.